Welcome to mine and Peter's very first ever podcast. I'm Deborah Alcott Tyler. Uh, I'm Peter Wanless. And we're absolutely delighted that, well, hopefully there's at least one listener, if not more. This is the first time Peter and I have ever done anything like this. And so there's, it's, there's bound to be glitches. It'll probably all go horribly wrong, but it's going to be enormous fun to do it. It came about because Peter and I have known each other for quite a long time, and um, we always have the most amazing chats when we're together. We're very similar in many ways, but also quite different in other ways. And so, you know, most of our conversations tend to be fun, quite robust, and all the rest of it. And it was Peter's idea. He messaged and said, look, we don't see enough of each other to talk as much. Why don't we do something like this? It gives us a great idea to keep connecting and having those good old arguments and discussions we have. So this is why we've decided to do it. We have no idea how it's going to go. Neither of us are particularly technically competent, although we do have the support of my lovely colleague, Jose Blasque, if that's how you say it, um, to keep us going through this. So and we will see how it goes. So, Peter, how are you feeling about our very first ever podcast? Yeah, good. So, of course, the main thing that you and I have in common, uh, Twinny, is that's that we cool. were born on the same day of the same month of the same year and we are both um well by the time this goes out we would have both had a very big birthday um and i'm not going to say uh what the number is because it's quite a it's quite a challenging number but um we do call one another twinny um most of the time and you, you say we're quite similar but people who know us i think may feel we're quite different um uh i think of you as a I think your image is of a really noisy up and at them uh, <laughs> woman shaking her fist and um, demanding this, that, and the other. And I am a sort of quiet uh, ex civil servant, evolutionary behind the scenes uh, plotter. Um, and yeah, well, so who knows if we agree on lots of stuff or disagree on stuff, but we do, you're right, we have, we have good robust conversations um when we meet one another so it should be fun it should be fun and i must admit i'm i'm terrified about this impending birthday peter i mean i when i turned 50 that was great i you know well you know we had a joint we had a party and, yeah we had a party and it was a real celebration i felt really good about turning 50 this next big birthday is really slapping you about the face. You know, I'm finding it difficult to acknowledge it. I'm refusing to have parties or anything like that. I'm like, and I find it really interesting how much I'm struggling with this particular number because it's only a number, you know, but how much I'm finding it affecting my view of myself. And, you know, I don't know, are you having the same experience? Um, well, about a year ago, um, I thought about it and decided that this would be the moment when I would step down from the NSPCC. So my plan was that uh, it did mark a significant moment in time and I could do the CEO NSPCC job forever if they would let me because I love it so much. But uh, there comes a time when you need to move yourself on and I think the organisation needs to, to move on. So I kind of carefully planned with my chair of trustees that um, the day before our big birthday would be my very last day at the NSPCC and the birthday would be the start of the rest of my life and it hasn't quite worked out like that because administrative delay and difficulty and all the rest of it has meant that I'm actually um my last day at the NSPCC is going to be the 6th of December so um yeah it has been a big thing and, I, and I've um drawn all those sort of things together so i'm going to have a big party but it's going to be a sort of leaving the nspcc party rather than a uh, yeah. a birthday party and and that has i think yeah enabled me to think about well um what comes next because you know that it's it's not very old really when i look around at quite a few of the people who i admire and are doing extraordinary things they're you know 70 this 80 that well anyway so i uh yeah it's uh don't 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 feel don't feel down about it there's lots to look forward to well i love the way you've described it as being like it's the next chapter of your life you know i think that's that's how i've got to look at it really i do wonder actually if you know if, there, if there's a like a gender factor as well like you know being an old lady now as opposed to the young vibrant you know Go getting described earlier, but anyway, I will <laughs> keep keep going getting, as you know. 
So in this podcast, we're going to chat about all sorts of things, Peter and I. We're going to talk about society, we're going to talk about charities, we're going to talk about ourselves, whatever happens to crop into our heads. And also we're very interested if, you know, listeners have sort of thoughts about stuff that they would like to send in and say, you know, what do Deborah and Peter think about these? Please, by all means, send them in. We'll talk about pretty much everything. Um, so it should be great fun. So I'm going to start, Peter, by saying, yeah. so what's happened to you last week? What's been going on? Um, well, so last last week, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm the chair of a coalition of around 60 organizations and we call ourselves the X a change makers so there was this huge independent inquiry into child sexual abuse which sat for seven years it cost a quarter of a billion pounds um, it wow. heard from over seven thousand victims and survivors of child sexual abuse brought out its final report and nothing happened and so we have come together because we will not allow this to be the final word for all those victims and survivors who who spoke out. And so last week, um, I was at a conference which we put together, which was exclusively hearing the testimony of 15 people with lived experience of child sexual abuse. And it was incredible in so many ways. Uh, One felt, you know, moved. Oh, oh and, and, we, and we did it. You know, we deliberately organised it in that way. And we invited all the, uh, well, we invited the ministers. Jess Phillips came at the beginning, um, Minister for Safeguarding um, and Child Protection. Um, the other ministers didn't come, but we had senior civil servants from all the key departments. And so um, the strategic objective was to move them to see that. Um, uh, there are massive issues which need to be uh, addressed, um, but to illustrate the issues through the voices and perspectives of those who have lived experience. And as you would expect, it was it was an incredibly um, moving occasion and uh, really, I think, a, a brilliantly organised to be trauma informed. So there was lots of um, encouragement and support for those people who were uh, speaking and those people who were listening, because as you can imagine, it wasn't an easy thing um, to go through. But my, my goodness, at, at the end of it, you couldn't do anything other than feel both angry and at the same time determined that something more had to be done. So from here on, all our organisations who were present in the room share that experience. And we are hopefully going to engage with uh, civil servants who haven't just seen the, um, uh, the, the, the theory of the recommendations, but can understand what that means in human terms. Um, and you and you, you, you know very often we'll hear from one person with lived experience and and everyone will say oh you're very brave or oh we we pity you for what you've been through and and together um our speakers were so determined we don't want your pity we don't want your thanks we want to see a step change in what's going to happen to people who've experienced child sexual abuse so that was without doubt the highlight of my week last week my head is still kind of half full of it and 11 and a half years at the NSPCC it's probably in the sort of top 10 of days um that I'll carry around with me for forever so it yeah it's a bit special I won't have something like that every week to talk about no. but it yeah, yeah it's I, was talking, I feel so it's a position now but you know it's really interesting that you say that because of course you know, we go into things with all these expectations about reports and evidence and the rest of it, and then the report comes out and then nothing happens. It's not uncommon, is it? We see it in all sorts of other areas where investigations happen. And I think that's the thing I love about our sector, the charitable sector, mm -hmm. is that we don't let stuff drop. You know, we keep going and we keep going. I think there's a the phrase they use in campaign, isn't it? It's something like persistence overcomes resistance. And it's about the fact that you mustn't give up just because the change doesn't happen at the point at which you've said it was, just because something slides just because something doesn't move as quickly that's exactly when we have to keep 
picking up the baton and keeping on going and keeping on reminding people and keeping getting people together. And that's, I mean, that for me just sings of what it is that's so incredibly special about our sector. All those people come together and say, no, it's not good enough and we are going to make it change and you will pay attention in whichever way, shape or form that happens. That's amazing, Peter, amazing. And the people well, and, and the people who the colleagues who sort of organise this um, experience to help. I mean, if you are one of those seven thousand people, I mean, you're already angry because you've let down, been let down by anything and everything that's happened. You've been encouraged to speak up, and then nothing really material happens for two years, and then you're invited along to another conference to say to reflect on the fact that nothing has happened. It's it's pretty demoralizing so another thing that we can do as well as get angry ourselves and associate with these folk is yeah try and um get some of that spirit that you've just illustrated um going to uh help these folk see that it doesn't have to be like this and the other thing which which was really well organized about the the speakers was that for some of these people some really great things had happened and they were being successful in some aspects of their lives. So it wasn't, you know, unadulterated misery and negativity. You could see, if you looked hard enough, um, that there are ways in which things can be made better. And to have the people with lived experience talk to one another and reflecting that with one another, as opposed to, you know, hearing a lecture from me about, um, the overall national picture i think worked very okay. well but these are that there, there are um the, the whole national debate at the moment is quite interesting isn't it about misery versus hope yes 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 yeah and i was going to come on to talk to that, about that in a bit actually but yeah my highlight from last week was we had our first i think probably our first ever women in leadership conference and we did open it up for um, men to come. And we did, you know, say we really encouraged men to come, but not a single one of them did, which is an interesting thing, because obviously this was about allyship. And, right. you know, apparently we don't have any allies, Peter. So, you know, or part no, you, our, you, like, can, you can be quite intimidating. Yes. Well, but, but apart from my one trustee, Peter, not Peter, sorry, um, Andrew Perkis, who came and he spoke on the panel very bravely about feminist leadership. And it's the interesting thing, and the thing I love about Andrew so much is that he's the epitome of everything you assume. So, like, he's a privileged white man, a practicing Christian. He's been around a very long time. He's had very senior jobs. He's got an OB, etc. And so, you so it's very easy to have a stereotype about him. And actually, he's one of the best female allies I've ever come across. He's like he's a feminist leader himself. He like he tries to practice the principles of feminist feminist leadership in his own life and the way he does things. And the whole day was really, really inspirational. We had some fantastic speakers. We had Tasha Jones, who's a world champion and Olympic gold medalist in boxing, talking about how you survive in boxing when you're a female. And when I, I can't remember the stats now, but something like 87 percent or something of the whole of the boxing world is full of blokes and not just blokes. She's saying boxing blokes. So they think they're tough and, you know, that kind of thing. She said, like trying to hold your own and be in that space. It was just inspirational. And Zara Mohammed, who is, um, as you know, is the a new I think they call them the Secretary General, is it? Is it the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain? I think that's the term. That's their sort of top term, right. talking about being voted in as a 29-year-old 29 and how the, the levels of like instant negativity at her because she was a Muslim woman. And she's saying, look, I've just been appointed the leader and everybody banging on about hijabs and all that kind of thing. And it was just incredible, absolutely incredible. 77 women all sharing their stories and talking about the fact that you know, a lot has changed, actually. We all acknowledge that, you know, a lot has changed, but there still is a lot to change. And I think as well, the real honesty that, you know, the women were talking about how our own internalised misogyny, it's very easy to think that, you know, the patriarchy and misogyny is all centred upon its blokes who are the problem, but actually the women themselves saying we buy into some of those stories as well about other women and about how we perceive other women. And we've got to look into our own selves. You know, we're not mm -hmm. innocent in all of this behaviour. So so I did find that, you know, not entirely on the scale of what you've described, but I did find that really, really interesting and really powerful. And, you know, these amazing women who just are leading and leading difficult, challenging organisations, you know, did, you know, some of them obviously working with children and young people, some of them working with refugees and asylum seekers, working with some of the most challenging 
you know, can you, or some of the most challenged rather, because they're not challenging, they're challenged because the circumstances don't allow them to be able to thrive and grow in the way we'd want them to. So, yes, yeah, so I think we both had time out with people who we serve, who, and I came away feeling super energised about possibilities from the future for that too. And do you think it's, a, well, you, you indicated when you started introducing your experience, it's a bit of a problem that men aren't involved in yeah. the, uh, in, in the conversation. And um, yeah, I, I, I wonder about whether or what I, I say. It's, it sounds uh, it, it, I, I wouldn't put it at the top of my list to come along to your conference there because yeah. I, I would feel. Um, I mean, maybe you, you want or need me to listen, like I wanted the civil servants to listen at the back of the room and not try and take over and, and chair it or you know participate in quite the same way. Um, yeah. Maybe there is there's some sort of way in which these conferences or experience could be engineered um, to get greater male participation. I would rather attend that though than a conference of a whole load of male boxers. That sounds terrible. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting. It, it's you know, it's cause I've been thinking about the dreadful situation of Giselle Pellico. You know, that woman in France and the absolutely vile experience that she's been through. And it's been very, lots of the, you know, people commenting on social media, it's been a real absence of men saying anything. And, you know, the women themselves have been saying, why is that? Why is it that men are so quiet about this particular thing? And it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because I think for some, it's kind of the sense that I actually genuinely don't know what to say. And I don't want to not all men, because as you know, Peter, that really winds women up when men say not all men, you know, we're yeah. like, yes, but too But I also wonder how much of it is is men themselves thinking, well, I would never do it. And I don't think I know anybody who would do it. So therefore, you know, I, there isn't anything I need to say about it. I mean, I, I genuinely don't really know. And and as women, I think women generally are quite baffled by the, the lack of, you're absolutely right, this is outrageous. You know, like why men are so, are they afraid to step into those spaces yeah. and say those things? If they yeah. are, what are they afraid of? Or, you know, I, I don't have the answer. And I don't, yeah. I'm not being judgmental. I think no, I'm not no. saying it's a bad I, I, thing. It's just need it to change and i've no I, idea how to get it to change yeah I, I can't speak for for men but i can speak for myself that i have been reticent about um gesture politics and and and, and sometimes i do feel like if i chip in and say oh yes i'm with you um that looks yeah. a bit kind of superficial because you don't it, 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 you don't need at one level me or some random man saying yes that's fine and and i i have been slow as a consequence you know to do things like express comment about religious festivals beyond christmas but having been it doesn't take very much to be invited in to um learn or understand and then uh i'm there yeah uh, and well, have well, learned a very great deal, and yeah. then it becomes so. Last last year, uh, I got up at uh, four o'clock in the morning to join one of our Muslim staff when she was um, uh, getting ready to start the fast on on that day, and it was it was kind of novel. Now, in my mind, I thought, what a what a silly sort of gesture thing to get up one day at four o'clock for a headline, and I'm doing it now. I feel. Uh, at one level, and if, and now everyone says, "Wasn't that brilliant? Wasn't he amazing?" The chief executive got up for day. Well, I did, but it's not the same as fasting for the whole of the religious festival, is it? And um, so you somehow creating the conditions for it to to be welcomed in maybe accelerates um, the discussion Definitely. a bit. Twenty to twenty. Every single piece of support, even if it's just a piece of verbal support, saying this is outrageous. I can understand why women are so angry. Every bit helps, every public bit. Because what you do, and I'm not talking about you personally, yeah, or yeah. you personally, generally, every time you speak out, it encourages other people to speak out, encourages other people to be brave about it and to be open about it. And so never worry about the performative side. I mean, I have the same, I worry about performative statements about things. But actually, you know, having been in some of those similar situations myself, I know how much it means when somebody says, I, I get it. And it's not right. And I don't know what to do, but I want you to know that I care. You know, even if it's just as much as that, it really does make a difference. It was the same with the riots, for example. We had, and I'm sure you had the same, but we had our staff at DSC really quite upset about what was going on. Some of them feeling really quite frightened yeah. about what they were doing. 
you know, one one of my directors in particular saying that like, she was really worried about even though, well, even though they weren't happening particularly where she was, she was feeling very, very self-conscious and, and quite sort of frightened about, you know, going out in public spaces while that was going on. And it's really interesting because we talked it through and we just gave, we, you know, as much love and support as we could and, you know, whatever. And she said that really helped. Even though you didn't physically change anything, even though you couldn't do anything about this, fact, the fact that you understood, you listened and you said, I get it, it's not right. And we're on your side was really powerful. So that's been a real lesson for me too, because I've been like you. Eight performative yeah. statements. I stand with X and I blah blah blah. It yes. always feels a bit meaningless. Where's the action? I'm an action woman, as you know. But actually, I've come to realise that sometimes just saying it really yeah. helps. The other thing that uh, I've been super careful about um, at, at the NSPCC is not to be commenting on anything and everything um, to do yes, with absolutely. children because you dilute the impact of what you yeah. stand for, but one can confuse the institutional power of the brand with just being a kind and compassionate leader. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, yeah, I think I, I, I've learned and I'm still learning um, where and how there's value in just small acts of kindness. I, encu- I encourage other people to exercise small acts of kindness and yeah. then I'm probably not good enough at doing it myself because I'm too busy and then I make these excuses about, um, uh, well, I don't want to dilute the message and I can't be commenting on everything. And, and but, but actually, as you say, okay. it's the reverse of, I've seen you say before, um, when um, men agonise about these things, just don't be a dick. Um, and it's yeah. the reverse of that, isn't it? What's the, what's the cost of being nice to someone, I suppose? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the worst mm. you're going to get is, you know, a little bit of someone being sarcastic or horrible uh, up to you online, you know, or someone and that, that's like, welcome to the world of women. That happens all the time. Yeah. You know, the sort yeah. of the sarcasm you get when we say anything. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, it's been really <laughs> inspirational. It kind of brings me actually, because the other thing I've been thinking about is, you know, the, 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 this brand new Labour government. And, you know, yeah. any so this isn't a part of political point at all. Any change in government usually brings with it a form of kind of hope and like a sense yeah. of energy. And I I have to confess, you know, I understand the challenges that are being faced, but I do sort of feel that the messaging has been a real lack of hope. I mean, I, you know, I'm quite depressed by, you know, the message that the NHS is completely broken and, you know, this message is about no money without reform. And I think what kind of messaging is that to 1.5 million people who work in the NHS? You know, it just feels like a lack of hope and a lack of there's going to be an end point and we're working towards an end of thing. And like that's for me, that's just my personal perspective. I, I I feel that, you know, it's all about, oh, it's also shit, it's also terrible, it's all absolutely dreadful, which it is, but that no sense of, you know, but it's going to get better. And at the end of this process, we are going to have this and we are going to have that and we are going to have the other, that sort of energy and things like that. And I, get, I mean, you're way more experienced in the whole world of politics, Peter, than I am, but there, I'm still... You know, this because uh, I think that's one of the things that charities are so brilliant at is being purveyors of hope. You know, the whole point of charities is to say you do not have to accept the ways things are. And it might be difficult to get out of your addiction or to get out of your relationship or whatever the thing happens to be. But you can and we are here and we will help you to yeah. do it. And I would just really love to feel a little bit of that coming from this government or any government, to be honest. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> Take it, if take it back to the NSPCC and the succession of strategic positioning discussions that I have had with the trustees down the ages and, and our supporters, you know, we have a considerable number of people who are really motivated by our charitable purpose, which is to end cruelty to children. Um, and they want that sense of absolute uh, destination and we will not stop till it's done and it's a long-term goal and that's what we're that's what we're about um but then we have um at least as many other people who will say that's completely unrealistic and just you know sloganizing about ending cruelty to children when you've got uh people who through time have uh, abused children and the scale of the problems are so great that show us the practical impact and the difference that you're going to make yeah. in the next 12 to 18 months and, and and just kind of hello trees hello sky kind of message when what we can see in front of us is a completely broken system you know that 
that doesn't do it for me. So you probably it is probably one of these kind of both ands as a as a leader. You got to be able to you got to have a a vision of where you want to get to. Um, you got to do stuff like in the in the immediate term, and actually the bit in the middle is really difficult. And I suppose the bit in the middle is a, is a kind of time frame for a single parliament. Yeah. Let's say three to five years. What what can they achieve with the health service in three to five years? Um, yeah, I don't know because not- maybe people who work, who work in the, the NHS will say, "Well, thank you know, thank goodness at last they're they're calling home. Yeah. We're struggling. We're working really hard, and 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 Which and we feel are. some hope." in um someone acknowledging that we are it's yeah, not our true. fault there's something bigger than us that is causing the yeah. problem that's a really excellent point actually peter i'm reminded very much of an old chief it's echo mine a chap called john garnett who used to talk about eyes on the hills feet on the ground and also actually that that's that's kind of what we do those of us yeah. who engaged in making and trying to improve things it's very much that isn't it we've got to have an eye to the bigger picture but the short term the feet on the ground you've got to cover the terrain before you can get to the top of the mountain it's yeah and I think often when we're looking at politicians in particular we forget that you know like all the choices that they have to make I mean my mother was shouting at me about the winter fuel allowance which she doesn't need by the way you know she freely acknowledges that she doesn't need it but you know about this poor decision and we were talking about well in all of the things that you've got to do, somewhere somewhere you have to make a decision. And we might not agree with that one particular one, but if it's not that decision, then it's a different one. Yeah. You know, it's like they're, they're having to make judgments. I wonder sometimes, though, whether they work hard enough to create the context for decisions. Any of us, actually, not just politicians, but we as, as you know, leaders in our own organisations. I think sometimes we focus on one thing and we forget that, if, that people are not, not really stupid. And once you show them a bigger picture... You say, look, we have to balance this and this and this yeah. and this, and yeah. as that we've yeah. it's rather, especially with rather than shooting around big, you know, big numbers and saying, you know, we've got this twenty-two billion pound hole or whatever it is, because that kind of like just goes over people's heads. But saying these are the choices we were faced with, and we chose this one, and here's why. Yeah. I think that helps people understand a bit more the decision making, even if they don't agree with it. And I think that's it, true in organisations. Yeah, too. yeah, that there was a. So back in the day, I spent most of my 20s working in the chief secretary's office in the Treasury. So controlling public Thank expenditure you. was me. Um, and uh, well, I say it was me, it was my life. I was a tiny cog in the um, in the scheme of what was going on. Um, but, uh, yeah, in my mind, that decision would have been much better contextualised across all the options and choices with the big arithmetic, which is now done from arm's length of government as well yeah. um so there is you can take someone else's figures and then say well look here are the choices that we've made and these are the ones that we've made and, and defend them rather than picking one out i, I you know i wondered i that if they felt that because there was a need an urgent need to help public services by mm-hmm. settling these pay disputes that that was quite an expensive thing to do and that as a a Labour government in order to demonstrate we're not just about spending money in the short term, but we can um, do something which uh, is tough on public spending in the shorter term as well. That that was the kind of, I can imagine sitting yeah. in a meeting in the Treasury and having that sort of a, a conversation yeah. um, which works in the in the abstract, but it's uh, it's led them you know, into significant um uh difficulty because of the um life stories that people are now um coming up with education isn't it it's like you know because because to be able to because again it wasn't presented in context either so for example you know my parents had a 10 percent pay increase in their pension this year and they're going to get another five six hundred pounds something like that i can't remember the exact number next year you know so so there is a context where there is an increase in money going to pensioners also about you know it's, it's talking in absolute so the actual number of pensioners those ones who fall on the cusp where there are challenges or where they don't have pension, the actual number that it's going to mm-hmm. affect and i think when given information like that that again helps to contextualize those decisions not that i'm saying people should or shouldn't agree with it you know it's like i'll, I'll keep my personal view about it to myself but yeah. i do think that when we don't contextualize it and what happens is people just focus on one thing and it looks like a dreadful thing that's happening like you know millions of pensioners yeah. up and down the country to death it tells the wrong story and it's and also i think it's 
it's it's sort of it's disrespecting the British public, who I think you know who we tend to treat as if they're really stupid and don't want to know. But actually, you start to talk to them and you show different points of view and you show a different perspective. They end up being, you know, I mean, one of my favourite programmes, Peter, is Gogglebox. I don't know if you've ever watched it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I watch it. So you love it. And one of the things I love about it is the fact that it's like kind of ordinary people commenting. And some of the comments they make on what they see in the news and things like that are really super intelligent, like really switched on and really like acutely observant of what's actually going on behind it. And I think the vast majority of the British public are like that, are able to have those conversations. But if we don't give them the right information, they're not going to be able to talk sensibly or, or sensibly rationally assess what they yeah. think about a particular yeah. thing. If if only it, if it was as simple as just yes. giving them the information, though, because of the you know fake news, distortions, echo chambers yeah. on social media, uh, newspapers with a particular um, angle to to spin. It's, it it isn't easy, is it? And it's it, and and setting the setting the budget and balancing the books is never. It's never easy. Never. Every, every year in our organisations, you know. we're having to make those sorts of choices, aren't we? And try to explain to people um, why, even if we've done something which has been brilliantly effective in the past with a limited budget, it might not be the thing that the charity is yeah. best suited to do looking oh, even forward. I mean, I have like, you know, we're going into budget season at DSC and my marketing team are like, you know, we need thousands of pounds spent to modernise our website. And I completely agree, except we don't have thousands of pounds. We literally don't have the cash to do it. You know, you've got to, so it's not like I'm just being difficult and sitting on a pot of money and telling them they can't have it. It's like we just don't have the money. So so often you'll face, and I guess the government's facing that, and we do in organisations, so particularly in smaller charities, we face these really horrible choices about things we know that we need. And yeah. I know that we in our website for the future because it's creaking and because you know we're going to lose revenue as a result of not doing it but i also know i've got the money yeah. you know i can't i'm just sort of caught in this horrible sort of thing of you know just having to stick things together with bits of string and sellotape and if you're lucky a bit of masking tape and, and when times are good you can afford to buy a hammer and a nail to hammer that thing back together but buying a new one like yeah, in our dreams, you know, it's just it, yeah, it's those yeah. constant and they're constant choices, aren't they? Exhausting. And it, and it, yeah, know. and it happens at all levels. And this is one of the things that I yeah. think on this podcast we can we'll we'll get uh, annoyed and irritated, irritated with one another about, or um, it'll just be a different sort of perspective because quite often smaller charities will will say and illustrate exactly the sort of challenges yeah. that you've described and think well nspcc is a 125 million charity so you can find the money to do anything you like and yet you know i was interested to see last week um cancer research uk brought out their accounts um for last year their income was 684 million last year they uh they spend more on fundraising alone than the nspcc spends in a year and yet they're projecting an eight million pound deficit uh yes. next year because what wherever you're at you've got money in and impact you and spend it your own. yeah we've known each other long enough now that i understand in fact i often use the nspcc as a really good example actually when people say all these massive charges say hold on a look if you look if you look at the nspc's accounts and you look at how much they bring you then how much they spend you then look at the size of the salary bill you then look at the cost of running the services they run and the cash they've got in the bank they're not actually it might it's more noughts but it's no less stressful and there's no less room yeah. to maneuver for them than it is for many people. So no, I definitely won't. Say, I will not say poor, broken, <laughs> small charities. And in fact, in many ways, smaller charities have way more freedom. You know, I always said the bigger the organisation you are, the bigger their expectations are on what you need to do in terms of like just the quality of the desks. You know, whereas at least in smaller organisations, it's much easier to say to people, look, we're going to have to have that desk that was donated by, you know, whoever it was, which is a bit dodgy and a bit wonky on one side. Whereas it's a lot harder to do that in larger organisations when you're subject to much more scrutiny and much more expectation on on that sort of thing. So, no, you won't catch me making those uh, okay. negative comparisons, yeah, yeah, yeah. I promise. But e out yeah. and, I, and I equally, I wouldn't say, you know, big is necessarily beautiful because uh, it's, it's, the, it's the difference you make with the money. Isn't it? Absolutely it is. It's, it's and we could have long conversations about how you measure that. Yes, exactly. It's what you do with what you've got, not how big it is or whether or not it's growing. That's the core message, isn't it? About whatever 
size of charity you're at. Oh, it's been fun, isn't it? Like, yeah. Already, I've only yeah. been talking for probably at least half an hour, I would think. Yes. I'm not sure. Easily, easily. Yeah. Yeah. I think and that's not bad for a first go. I don't think it's bad first go. And I hope people who've been listening have found, you know, something interesting. And even if, you know, I, I think we'd be happy, Peter, wouldn't we, if people like disagreed with what we said and like, you know, flooded us in with that was absolutely wrong and how can you possibly say such a thing? You know, I think that would, uh, yeah, definitely, I, I would definitely. Not, uh, yeah, no, I'd be really interested to um, know what sort of topical issues that are affecting the charity sector in particular they like to ask questions about have us reflect yeah. on be provocative about whatever i will be whatever, i'll yeah. be released from my nspcc shackles to the extent they exist oh God, before I very long and who knows what i might say exactly what's going to come at us maybe our roles will completely reverse peter and you'll be the you know in your face what are you doing i'm saying <laughs> i peter, to calm down there are many ways to skin a cat you know forgiveness you know please forgive me all the cat lovers out there of which you are one of course because you have two cats don't you four cats I, i'm definitely not in the mark um game skinning cats i am no, a cat person me and taylor swift and i'm a dog person although I, i'm very fond of cats too i have had cats okay so i think that you know we can round this up now i thoroughly yeah. enjoyed it peter it's a really good idea of yours and i'm looking forward to doing it and to say to our listeners this is brand new we have no idea how it's going to go you know we've got plans to record these and release them a few times a month and you know our teams are like wanting us to pin us down to regular things but as peter and i are both still working chief execs at the moment it's quite difficult to find the time but we are going to do quite a few of these and see how it goes down and how it responds and we'd absolutely love to get your feedback and let us know whether you love us or hate us. And we won't care either way because we just like talking to each other, to be honest. So even if we're just talking to each other, we'll probably still do it, won't we, Peter? Probably will. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, lovely to see you. Thanks very much, Twinny. And you too, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Twinny. Oh, and happy birthday for next week. Yeah, happy birthday. And thanks, everyone, for listening.